I've, I'm using this nice piece of technology to keep my words to uh, a, li a, a, a limited number. I'm going to start it now. I'm going to try to finish in 28 minutes. I have 36 slides, so they're going to go quickly. Um, and I'm going to try to make this as animated as possible and give you, at first, just a little bit of background. But I really appreciate all of you coming tonight. Um, this is a project we've worked on for a long time. We had enormous help from the Harris School of Public Policy, from National Opinion Re Research Center, which we wouldn't have been able to, we really wouldn't have been able to do the project without the scale of activity that NORC is capable of doing. We had, um, in one case, we have 550 interviews that needed to be transcribed and coded. We had, the, all of those interviews had to be done. Um, they are long, they are complicated, and so taking this on without an adequate um, institutional um, component that is capable of doing this would have would have made the, the whole process just it, painful, if not impossible. So, um, w the just want to say a couple of words about the Cultural Policy Center. Um, Betty Farrell here is is our director, um, and the the idea of founding this center was that the arts and culture sector is probably the least understood and the least studied. Um, it's something that lots of people participate in. A lot of people have a lot of opinions about how it should work, how it does work, how it doesn't work, how it seems not to work. But um, we decided that like education and healthcare, that it deserved empirical study as well because out of <laughs> empirical study, good decisions aren't necessarily made but can be made because people actually have data upon which to make their decisions. So we, we've we been particularly interested, because the sector is uh, uh, certainly in the not-for-profit not side, always in some kind of distress, that we wanted to do something for the sector that, that the people in the sector said, we need help with this. And what happened was we were hearing from um, a lot of um, arts consultants that they were advising projects that were one after the other growing, g growing out of control, getting too expensive, becoming unsustainable, um, driving the organizations that built them off, off mission, and that basically they didn't, they said, w we know there are stories about this happening and we try to cite newspaper articles and things, but we don't. We don't have anything we can refer to that's a study of what has actually happened. We sense that there's a huge amount of building taking place. A lot of people are building buildings that they're not quite sure why they're building them other than other people are building them and that they should maybe do it too. So anyway, I'll move quickly through this. But um, basically, um, if, if you think just of the complexity of the relationship between the for-profit and not-for-profit sectors, this is in terms of what we are studying here. Just that issue of how production values at um, um, in Disney films, in Avatar and Titanic, in um, Broadway productions like the recent Spider-Man, put out the dark, light up the, well, I forgot which one it is, <laughs> but um, that what people have come to expect when they go to a not-for-profit theater is extremely <coughs> high production values. That gets really, really expensive to do. But people will no longer settle for um, a ferry coming across um, on a rope um, <laughs> with the sandbag visible back there that's keeping them um, levered. So in any case, um, the, we, just, we got a group of people together at the Rockefeller Brothers Center at Pecanico, and we trapped them for two days. We got somebody who is in charge of helping us draft this proposal, which ended up being a 15-page single-space proposal to the Mellon Foundation, the Kresge, and to um, the MacArthur Foundation. And we trapped them and kept telling them that was a really interesting idea, but they had to shelve that and put it over in the corner because we had to stay focused. That was the hardest two days of my life. I went and slept for many days um, after that trying to recover from, but we did it and we got the proposal, we got it in and we got it funded. Um, the team, I won't go into any details here, but the team, all of these people were either at the University of Chicago or got their degrees at the University of Chicago. We got um, 
a sociologist, two economists, a professor at the business school who's now the co-dean um, who studies entrepreneurship, and a survey, that's Rob Gertner, um, sur a survey methodologist, Norman Bradburn, who has been every, had every office at the University of Chicago, as far as I can tell, except pre the president. So anyway, we had a great team. We got together. And basically, what we were, what the problem we're looking at is that there appeared to be a really substantial overinvestment in bricks and mortar. They were investing a lot of bricks and mortar and not so much on mission fulfillment by organizations. Um, they were running into the same kinds of hurdles. Some were failing and some were suffering very badly. But what there wasn't was any, any data to make it possible to do um, d informed decision making with actual information that would be available to everyone. Um, so basically, quickly, what we did, um, the three categories, first of all, it's very important for you to know, I will speak about the Logan if somebody asks me, but we dealt with, we did not deal with any colleges or universities because their finances are terribly complex and there would be no way on God's earth we would ever get the figures that we needed from them and the information we needed about how they made their decisions. It's hard enough to do what we did, I can promise you. But So we did museums, theaters, and performing arts centers. We did new construction and renovations, and we went back as far as 1994 because we knew that people's memories, if they were being interviewed, would be still, um, let's say, imperfect prior to 1994. Um, one of the most fascinating things we found in the study is that there were amazing numbers of um, revisionist narratives about what had happened. <laughs> and so if you can imagine, that happens about a week after the events unfold. <laughs> so if you go back to 94 and people are trying to dredge this out of their memory. So we did all of these interviews. As I said, they were all um, coded and we pulled the information out of them. They're all anonymous. People spoke to us only because it was anonymous. So out of the 800 projects, 844, that we identified across the country, we cho chose 56. These are not identified um, because that's our agreement. These are in a vault. They're available to researchers. Anybody can use them that can prove that they're going to actually do research. Um, and so this is not good here. Hold on a second. This is not. There we go. Um, so um, we did a. Um, also, we developed case studies. These are what I would strongly recommend that you take a look at. We have four case studies. Um, they make very good reading. They are short. Um, they are succinct. Um, one is of the, of the Art Institute's Modern Wing. Another is of the Taubman Theater in Roanoke, Virginia, which is one of the sadder stories that we had to tell, but it was a very, very instructive <laughs> one. Um, the Dallas uh, at and um, Performing Arts Center in Dallas, which is still $40 million in the hole and hasn't paid for their building. Um, and then finally, the Long Center in Austin, Texas. Um, there was a very complex process in trying to pick these so that they were representative. Each story represents a different set of problems, a different w way of um, tackling how these projects got built, what, kinds of th what the decision-making process was. What forces were at work? I cannot begin to tell you how, um, I had no idea how complex these projects are. If you're building, in some cases, a $400 million structure. Um, we're gonna go visit one in Las Vegas. It just opened in March. It was $470 million. These are complex, extremely difficult projects to pull off. They take an enormous amount of work of understanding. They take experts of all different kinds. They take smart trustees, durable trustees, uh, indefatigable trustees, and good executive directors who don't fly the coop two years into the project and go somewhere else because they get a better um, offer. Um, so these are all things that we looked, we looked at. But in any case, um, w w what we did find here, um, Let's see, first, what we wanted to find was how many buildings were built. We found that, 840. Why did cities and organizations invest? And that's a much harder question to answer than you might think. Really, why did they do it? Sometimes they did it because they wanted to do it. They didn't do it because there was a demand for it. No one was saying, we're, we've run out of room. We don't have any more room to do these productions. They just 
So we're going to talk a little bit, and I'd love to have some questions about this, about the issue of distinguishing want from need, because it's a big problem in these projects. What were the characteristics of projects that succeeded? And this in itself, I mean, I'm from the University of Chicago, so I make everything into a problem, but <laughs> the, the success is a very difficult issue. An architect can think that the building was a huge success, even though it's on the verge of bankruptcy. The people, the executive director can feel it's a success because he's filling the house, but he's filling the house with, um, with productions of Snow White, and the artists are not happy with that. So there's many different ways to describe it. We'll go into that a little bit. <coughs> so this was our big failure. We thought we could understand better when, for instance, the cluster of buildings that were built in Chicago, Millennium Park, the Modern Wing, the, um, uh, all the buildings that came a little earlier, like the Joffrey, the Joffrey that was finished, how do those, do they tap out a community? Do they draw too much money out? Do they make other smaller institutions suffer because they don't have enough, um, the people don't, there's not enough resources in the community? It turns out it would have cost, our project cost $1,150,000, four years to do. We, we would have had to spend another million or a million and a half dollars getting the amount of data to actually meaningfully answer that question. And we do not know the answer. What we know is that during the period when all of these were built, up to 2008, it didn't seem to matter. If you ran out of money, somebody was found who would come up with another $10 million, or 20, or 30, or 40 million. I mean, not a single person, but it, it, to say that there was a cap on how much money was available proved to be um, either false or very difficult to establish what the situation was. What we did find was that there was a big boom. It's very um, it, interesting. What I, one of the things I wanted to, to point to is we, we decided, because I was originally trained as an historian, we decided it was really important to frame this in a sort of century-long context. And there was another building boom in the Gilded Age. And the Gilded Age, sort of 1890 to 1920, 25, well, to 29, um, they, there were a lot of buildings built, but they were almost exclusively in places like Philadelphia, uh, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Chicago, all industrial cities, San Francisco, New York. New York had been building all along anyway, but more buildings then. But what's interesting is there was a very little built out in other parts of the country, comparatively speaking. This is a very, very different building boom. It was quite fascinating, and you'll see how, how that's true in just a moment. Basically, what we found is that there was at least $15.5 billion worth of buildings built, and that, does, that was based only on initial cost estimates. So $15.5 billion, which we estimate is closer to $28 billion because that did not include fitting out any of these buildings or cost overruns. And in terms of cost overruns, theaters on average went over by 18%. Museums went over by 69%. These are averages. And performing arts centers went over by 82%. So they're huge, huge cost overruns. So the actual cost puts the building that took place in the cultural sector in the same league as education and health. I mean, they're not quite, I mean, they're not directly uh, comparable in some ways, but there was a lot, a lot, a lot of square feet of buildings produced in the United States in this, in this period. We picked the 2008 cutoff because we wanted to know how they were actually functioning. Did they actually even open their doors? Um, some cases, they didn't get as far as opening their doors. One of the most humiliating and humorous um, events that happened to us in this process was a Simpsons episode that was done in 2007, which we showed when we were rolling out this project in the first iteration. And one of the researchers, the key researcher really is Joanna Waronkowitz, who's, who's <laughs> graduate of PhD last December. She said, I can't believe you re you've reduced four years of my work to a Simpsons episode. <laughs> but we took the Simpsons episode and basically Springfield decided to build a performing arts center. And some, Marge had the idea that she'd ask um, Frank Gehry. So she wrote him a letter and he got this letter and he went, Springfield? He <laughs> pulled it out of his mailbox and he said, Springfield? <laughs> and he threw it on the ground. He went like this, crumpled, and he went, oh! <gasps> And he said, that's it. And 
And he picked up the crumpled piece of paper and, and, and he built this big structure. And, and, and so, long story short, because this clock is ticking here, long story short is that um, they build the building, the building opens, the first performance is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. The audience is just full of expectation, and as soon as they hear the first bars, they go, oh. <laughs> and one of them says, I've heard that one before. <laughs> and another says, I have that on my cell phone as my ring. I like it better on my cell phone. <laughs> and it devolves downward. The doors are finally locked. It goes through all kinds of commotion. And finally, Mr. Burns buys it and turns it into a for-profit prison. <laughs> so. Joanna Waronkowicz was not amused by my <laughs> showing, uh, showing this. She said, our study is much more serious than that. And I said, it is, but they did hit it right on the head. What was fascinating is that this was a group like the deputy director of the National Endowment for the Arts and all of these foundation people. They had never seen The Simpsons. And they went, how did they know this? Who are the writers? How did they get? Well, it's only the smartest group of people in the United States that are actually writing the scripts for that. So anyway, it was very funny. So. Um, this will show you here, this is fun. Um, this shows you starting in 2000, whoops, 2008, um, what, let's see, I wanna go back to the original right there. That's, this is the buildings that started. These are called metropolitan statistical areas. They're areas of at least 100,000 people with a town that has at least a few other little suburbs around it. This is, there, this is the, it's a f form that the census uses and um, they're used for all, all kinds of different uh, analyses. But this, we tracked where buildings were taking place. And it's really quite fascinating to watch what happens here <coughs> because it fills up, needless to say, Montana and Idaho are sort of out of the picture here. <laughs> but um, it, it grows and grows. But this basically goes from two to all of these, these uh, <coughs> structures being built in the south of the United States. And, um, the, and the explanation that we've come up with of why there, why did so much get built in the south? Well, the south, it turns out, was rapidly rising, had rapidly rising incomes in this period. Um, mu uh, uh, much more educational achievement than in the past. I mean, people were getting better and better educated. Um, and their incomes were increasing. And w w the reason I was comparing earlier this, this golden age of, of building the sort of gilded age period where all of the, uh, the grand palace um, theaters and the uh, museums were built is that, uh, and the contrast with this is this is communities that are basically feeling that they've lost the race vis-a-vis -vis other communities if they don't have a structure. It doesn't really matter so much what it is. It could be a museum, it could be a performing arts center. But status and civic self-esteem were very, very powerful um, drivers. Richard Florida's thesis about um, culture workers entered into this. He was running all over the country, persuading towns and cities to create cu uh, cultural buildings because they would get the best workers there that would, they'd want to be part of a city that had these. And so it was the promise of economic development. But the worst thing, I think, in some ways, when we heard this in some of these towns, is that they thought they would be identified as a backwater, or they were somehow backward, or they would just be untouchable in some way if they didn't have something. So we found really interesting cases where people, where a city would build when only 45 minutes away, an, another performing arts center had just been built. And then you look, and we're running to, into this actually right now in Greensboro, <coughs> North Carolina. I, uh, we had the most astonishing talk with them. They said, um, they told us we could tell anybody about this. They were not embarrassed. Um, they said, how do you talk to the arts organizations? They're so prickly. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean, how do you talk to them? I mean, wh who are you building this performing arts center for? And they said, well, we imagine they might use it, but it's actually, you know, because we want to get really good acts into our town. And I said, but you have one that's 50 minutes away in another, in another town. Um, this is in North Carolina. And they said, I know, but we want ours. And so they're going to do a $45 million in taxpayer-backed bonds to build a structure when they're not talking to the arts organizations that are in their town, in their city. And it might work, but I don't think so. Uh, I mean, <laughs> not on the basis of our research. So th that is an example of the kinds of conversation. This was an attorney 
and a property developer, and it was the mayor who wants this project to go forward. And so we're tracking this story. We're going to go down. And they've said, sure, use this as a case study. So we're going to. Um, it's going to be very interesting. Um, so w w what makes these stories really interesting, I think, one thing that makes them interesting is all of this cultural enrichment is being offered to a city, but one of the questions is who asked for it? Somebody wants to give it. Somebody wants to build it, but who, who asked for this? And where did the, how do you find and verify the need for it or that people actually want this particular thing? Um, so, um, whoops, didn't mean to do that. How do I turn this back on? Oh, this? Yep. Oh, good. All right, that's fine. Thanks. I'm all wired, so I feel like a bionic person in here. Here, so for recording this. So, okay, so um, we'll move beyond this now. Um, so, w um, w what we're what we tried to do is look at this the the total. Hold on a second. Let me hear. What we this is the uh, the points that I just made that there was this uptick. The performing arts were uh, performing arts centers were the dominant form of new facilities. More cities were building performing arts than uh, centers than anything else. That it grew faster um, than or at least on a par with other sectors, and that the South was one of the um, uh, the areas of the most growth. And finally, this was the notable thing, that small cities with fewer than 500,000 people were building, and many for the very first time. Um, then we, we move to what, what is it that makes people actually, I've got six minutes left, um, makes people feel it's feasible to build. Um, we've already gone through this. This, this shows you here, at all the projects we looked at, it took an average of nine years from, this was an average, some of them took 17 years, 16 years, but <coughs> an average of nine years to go from when the staff first started to spend time exploring the possibility of a new or renovated space, the moment when the board first spent up, uh, wrote a check to consultants to help plan the project, then when they got an approved and sp uh, construction plan with a budget, construction started and the project actually opening. This shows you how much continuity you have to keep in an organization if you want to see a project from start to finish. This is the average nine years. A few clocked in at four or five. Most of them um, were, were um, you know, o over nine. And this shows that, this is fascinating, that actually the uh, resident performing arts centers, the one that have multiple groups that are residents of a performing arts center, took the longest to build because they all quarrel, they all have needs, they all want other people to pay for their thing that they need, their special equipment, and why don't you all pay for it and chip in? And it's very different than, say, building Steppenwolf, a theater, which is just you know a theater. They may have a black box next to it or something, but it's very specific. A performing arts center has to deal with everything from a dance company to a marimba band to, um, I mean, a whole, whole range of different things, and also very fussy performers who want fancy rooms in the back to lounge in between performances and so forth. So this was fascinating to us that this took so much longer than the others. Um, and this also, um, this is just, turns out this is human nature. Surprise. Um, the Basically, what all of this chart here means is that rev revenues, the estimated revenues of what they thought during the construction process and after their revenues would be was almost always overestimated and their expenses were almost always underestimated. That did not <coughs> work well for stabilizing organizations. And so one of the things that happens is that the organization gets built. I have a thing here. Can I, which is the little, the top? Yeah, okay, look at that. Um, <laughs> that you start, you start here and you, t you have a big burst of enthusiasm and interest and then the figures of, of, of ticket sales or entry to the museum drop and then it does this, sort of hobbles along for quite a while. This was a pattern we found. And some find a way to stabilize and some continue to hobble and some fall off a cliff. Um, so uh, that's 
this happened over and over again, and it was based on the phrase that somebody told us on a board. He said, you know, I wish we'd understood from the beginning that hope is not a business plan. <laughs> and that's what happened in a lot of these, that people were just basing it on. And, and you want to be positive. I mean, you can't in, um, undertake a project for a not-for-profit organization, and, a ma and you can't start being negative. And that's one of the strange things that happens on boards is people, people start pushing out people that have any negative or, or critical remarks because of not explicitly pushing them out the door, but making life uncomfortable for them because as the head of the new Kaufman Center in Kansas City said with her tongue in her cheek, how did I run those board meetings? I said, all in favor, say aye. All opposed, say I resign. And she was tongue in cheek, but that's how, that's how, you know, if you need to get things done, you need everybody to pull in the same direction. So you get people to all pull in the same direction, but what if your plan is actually deeply flawed or, or has flaws that will create weaknesses in the future that will really um, impact the, the organization that you're presumably trying to help? So um, these are the general characteristics of, uh, you know, this is the hard part of social science is that you write these down and they stand, sound very bland. They sound like a scouting manual of, you know, things that you should do if you're a good person and that you want to behave well and be thought well of. But these, here they are. They are figuring out what your actual motivation for building is. And that includes if, if you've really woven the artistic mission and your best estimate at the, the demand for this, that will really help. But sometimes they just have a dream and it's not hooked or linked to anything except hope. And, and in, you know, that they think an inspiring building will, build, will, will bring a steady stream of people. People will want to give to it. People will buy tickets. They will come regularly and so forth, which is oftentimes not true. This issue of leadership, many of the organizations that suffered had very uneven leadership um, in the sense that people left abruptly, were fired. Um, there, was, there just wasn't st st uh, steady and reliable board governance and nor staff governance. Um, it could be either one of those. S and finally here, um, I have 44 seconds. Um, the, <coughs> the issue here was this was, this was an amazing, um, actually a, a, an amazing story emerged here on a group that we didn't specifically study, but we heard through um, the daughter of Walt Disney, who helped build Disney Hall in Los Angeles. Um, she first ended up with a parking garage for $45 million and a lot of terrible fights on the board. And she was so discouraged because they spent all the money and all they had was a parking garage. So her reaction to this because what had happened is that everybody went off in a different direction. There was not agreement on the shape of the building, on what it should be, and so forth. That she said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're disbanding this board. We're taking, we're creating a new 501c3 that will take responsibility for building this building. They are gonna be the kind of board members that are gonna under, that understand what it will mean to build a uh, several hundred million dollar structure. They, and then she said, I'm gonna pay for staff for this. They, the staff will bring documentation every two weeks to these board members and they will be able to process that and they won't get a big box of stuff every four months yeah. that they have to go through, which <coughs> happens. That happened many, many different times and people would leave the board that were really responsible and so forth. So she said, okay, when that's done, we're disbanding that 501c3, it's gone forever, the board goes away. We create a new 501c3 and that's the governing board. And it has worked. It's worked beautifully. The Disney Hall is very successful, but the Dorothy Chandler Hall, which is across the plaza, has plunged from uh, 210 nights a year to under 80. So, you know, the supply and demand for um, seats um, is, is an issue. So they built this very expensive, very good building. But so they're now going to do a $300 million renovation of the Dorothy Chandler. <laughs> so I'm told. So anyway, these are, I'm going to stop now because these, 
these are, uh, we, we came up with these. These are all things that need fleshing out. There's a lot of stories about how these actually, um, how the details of this um, play out. But um, it, it, I've, I've already actually gone through these, so I'll just done the implementation. This is one we haven't talked about, that you have to have, one of the things that we found is if you don't have a forum at the beginning of the process of, of talking about a new building where people can say, you know what, this is a harebrained idea. The way you're presenting is totally bizarre. And we need to stop and we need to have a conversation about how this, you need to answer my questions. That doesn't happen. People don't do it. They just, they, the a couple of people uh, go to a restaurant somewhere and they've decided they're gonna do this. They present it to the board. They've just sold their company. They have $30 million. They put it on the table. And everybody's too, you know, is too shy to say anything about it. They say, well, what if, what if this is a bad idea? So once the project starts, they don't stop. So if you don't do what we did find is if you don't do this in the first, very first part and put a safe place for dissent, the project's gonna, gonna go and those people are gonna fade away, the ones that m may have actually good sense of, about what, reasons that it isn't a particularly good idea. So, and then the ongoing um, issue of, of um, um, establishing, setting a firm limit on a budget and don't go over it. The Goodman Theater, which many of you know well, the Goodman's board was exemplary. They it were extraordinary. They said, we are not going to build this building until we have the money in hand. We, we will not deal in hope. We, will, we think this is gonna be a great project, but we're gonna make sure it happens. The Smith Center in Las Vegas, brilliant idea. They said, we're asking you for an $80 million endowment before we even start the project. And we're gonna put the money in escrow. And if we can't build the building, you get your money back. It's a gambling city, you know, so. Um, <laughs> they built the building and they have an $80 million endowment. And how smart is that? Because they don't come to people for an endowment when they're exhausted and their pockets are empty and they don't want to be asked by anybody for any more money. So um, um, the two big issues that I saw emerge from this that we haven't really been able to tackle are um, board governance. If you really want to get at what happens, you have to understand what, happened, uh, what occurs in these board meetings. And unless you're in these board meetings, you're not going to know because it's all, as the head of the Las Vegas project said, we kept our dirty laundry inside the boardroom, thank you very much, and we dealt with it. And they did, and they were very successful. They figured out what they wanted to do. They built this building, they've got an endowment. Um, and so how do you find out what these processes are actually like? We got some people to talk about it, but um, this is the final thing. This is the case study for the Art Institute. Um, at one point, Renzo Piano wanted to put tiny motors on all of the glass windows, the louvered glass windows at the top. Can you imagine the maintenance on tiny motors in a city that has minus 40 degrees to 115 degrees? Um, this was a very interesting project. I would strongly recommend you read this case study. It's really quite fascinating how the budget grew, how the idea grew, and then what happened as a consequence. The Art Institute will survive it because it has a half billion dollars in an endowment but a lot of institutions do not have a half billion dollars to cushion them. Um, the Long Center, another interesting story in Austin, Texas. Um, the da this is a dramatic story of what happened in Dallas. Dallas has a ton of money. They way overestimated what people would be willing to give, and there's still 40 million in the hole to pay for the construction. They've still got huge loans out, to, and it's year, uh, several years now. That this was, known in the community as the Flying Nun. This was the Taubman Museum. This is the cautionary tale. It's an amazing read. Um, we found out recently that the board was fired in its entirety. The director has left, and the woman who started the project feels like she has been cursed in this life, and that she is, it's back in her lap, and she's determined to not have it fail completely, but it is, it's a museum that um, was financially stable when it began and ended up 
millions and millions and millions of dollars in the hole. It's a very interesting story. And the last thing I would like to say about all of this is that we, w you know, we take no pleasure in this. This is, we want arts buildings to be built. We want inspirational architecture to be um, um, commissioned and to make our, all of our lives better. But w our, our interest was in helping organizations from the very beginning think about creating sustainable structures. It doesn't have to mean that they will be uninspiring. They can be inspiring, but because there are good examples, but um, they need to be sustainable so that the communities don't come to think of them as a horrible burden. And a, a, this is just a nightmare. And when our study came out, the, apparently it just, it, it caused great distress in Roanoke. Um, they were very upset about the study. They were, um, but, but they knew that it was all true. I mean, it, it was, um, they wouldn't talk to us, so we got it all from the public record. But, um, but we weren't trying to call anybody out. It was, this is all constructive. It's not, we're not investigative journalists trying to make people's lives miserable. Um, so anyway, that's, um, that's it. So, um, what, oh, what's available? This is um, very important. On our website, the full academic report can be downloaded and each of the case studies is available. They are in color. They are graphically um, very attractive. And you can take anything. It's a very easy website to use. You click on it, a PDF comes up, and you can print it out. You can do anything you want with it. I would strongly recommend you look at the video. There's a nine minute, eight, eight and a half minute video. It's the second video by Peter Frumkin. It is made for boards <laughs> to listen to these, to the very distilled things that we, a very distilled version of things that we found. The boards that we know that have listened to it, we know that there are four projects now that have stopped in their tracks to, to take the study and see if they can persuade their board and persuade their funders that they've got a good, you know, a solid plan. Um, that makes us very happy to hear. Um, then there's a virtual bookshelf of other reading materials on this subject and for researchers, data in the NORC um, uh, enclave, data enclave, and two books coming out on this next year, one by um, Norman Bradburn and Joanna and myself, and another by Peter Frumkin and Anna Kalenda, who were at University of Texas, are now at Penn. Um, so there's two, two, two quite different kinds of books. Our book is the sort of monument to the study. It will have a number of new narratives of what happened to particular organizations. And the, again, the idea is to provide things that are board members, foundation people, everybody could read these. And then they just, hopefully, in the end, no one will, re will start another building, another ma major building project, without at least looking at the study. That's our goal, that we gathered all this information. We haven't provided revelations of any particular kind, but we, ha but we have hard data and we know what succeeds and what kinds of hurdles people fall, what bear traps they fall into. So on that note, I will stop and be happy to take any questions. So Veronica. Can you sort of get into this a little bit? What, what happens to these board members who are selected in the first place for their business acumen? <laughs> why do they fall apart in, in these situations? I mean, why do they perform so badly? Yeah. Um, it's really one of the great mysteries of, yeah. uh, to me because I, I serve on, um, boards myself and there are amazingly talented rigorous people but as Sandy Gutman who's the head of the um, just retired head of the Polk Brothers Foundation and who was the person who thought up the Harris Theater and with Joan Harris and and saw it through to completion she said I don't know Carol I don't know what it is but board members come in and they hang their brains up <laughs> with their coats at the door I don't know and it's they hang their brains at the door with their coats. And um, she wasn't being mean. She just said, it's quite bizarre because, and w w that's the next project that I actually want to work on is trying to get at not-for-profit board governance and find out more about it. Because actually, what's interesting is that people, unlike in a corporate board where you're paid, you have no vested interest. You know, you, 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 a lot of people are on these boards because their friends are on the boards and they think they should be on a board. Chicago is, I think, a particularly rigorous place. I think, I think you'd say this, Bob, that it's fair to say that if you're, uh, um, if you have any, if you want to be taken seriously in the community, you're on at least two 
if not three boards. <laughs> you know, you should be. I mean, it's just this notion you should be doing that. So how are board members actually trained to do what they, what they do? You know, how do they know the difference between management and governance? And they're a governance body, not a management. But oftentimes in a poor institution, and I've been part of one that was really quite a dramatic story, where it was so thoroughly falling apart that the board had to move in to help with management issues all the time. And then it's a totally contaminated process. And there's no way you can govern a structure that you're coming in late at night to do, help do the books and do, you know. So, so it's, a, it's a real puzzle. And it's, and it's, it's something, it's, it's another one of these issues that everybody knows about. But because all the board deliberations are secret, I mean, they're you know, private. It's hard to get at it. Yes. Hi, uh, uh, Jeanette Van Kersey. I don't mean to be facetious, but is there any factor of if you build it, they will come? Oh, the Bel the Belbao effect. Yeah, yeah. Is there? Um, um, the problem is, many many institutions saw those stories and thought that they, the Taubman, that was what the Taubman said. They said this is our Bilbao, and actually it was their very bad day. Um, they just, they, they won the day they decided to do this. It caused, uh, it, it's very difficult to pull that off, especially if you have no government support. Um, you know, but the, the countries where, you know, that was an EU project and there's a lot of money backing it up. Yes, if you're really, really smart and really lucky and you have a brilliant artistic product, yes, you can do it. But, but it's, it's like, um, many things that you, you hope that you're going to do well at your project, but you're well advised to maybe be slightly more modest. It's just more prudent to, and then maybe grow into that over, over time. Look at what Mrs. Walton just did in building the um, crystal bridges. Crystal bridges, it helps if you have $23 billion to your name, <laughs> and you're, you, know, you, can, you can fix things that go wrong. Um, but short of, of that, I think that museum, not just because she has money, she had a very clear idea, has a very clear I had and has a very clear idea. That may be a great success. I don't know. People are coming from all over the country to see it. So, you know, I, 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 it's not impossible, but it's, it's very rare and it's used all the time as a justification. So, did you have a question? Um, my hypothesis would be it's sort of like if you're brought onto the board, Part of your function is to be an evangelist, and you've got to believe in the cause. It's like being part of the church. Um, yes. You know, you have faith in this. Forget the budget. You know, we have faith in this cause, and we're going to make it happen. Do you think there's some of that? Going? There's a lot, and that, if you read the one on the Dallas um, Opera, um, the, the Performing Arts Center, and particularly the Opera House, the person they brought in said, "167 million." Poof. You can raise, this is Dallas, you can raise a lot more than $167 million. And they said, how? Um, and they said, just believe in it. <laughs> you know, we can do this. We're Dallas, we can do this. And, and I, oh, I, I, was, I was stunned when I read the transcripts of this because you could see what was happening, in the, you could have visualized what was happening in the boardroom when, are you gonna be the sourpuss the big wet blanket that says, no, this is too hard. We might not raise the money. And then what happens if we don't? And the answer is Spurtus is what happens, you know, here in Chicago when two other organizations are renting your space um, and you're not in it and your museum is open two days, two afternoons a, a month. Um, you know, it's, it's the, the, the stakes are high. I go back to my original statement. These are very complex, difficult structures to put together and make successful. They're extremely, extremely complicated. And you have to have um, money, endurance, a, a, a lot of brains on the board. But um, also, so think of something as simple as if you're going to build a new building. Think of when, when the Chicago Opera, uh, Chicago Opera Theater was up at the Athenaeum, yeah. the dusty little Athenaeum Theater where you sort of slid out of your seat because it was all tilted, <laughs> and you said, it's a fabulous opera, but I really need to sit in a horizontal seat. <laughs> um, and it's hard to bring my friends here to come support Chicago Opera Theater. Truth, truth in um, disclosure, I was the president of the board for three years, so it was very stressful. Um, and our, our, um, our budget went 
from what we paid for each night was what we paid for a week at the Athenaeum. Each night at the Harris was going to be what we paid for, for a, month, a, a full week. It was a staggering uptick. And also, um, the, 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 <clears throat> the degree of sophistication at the Harris, it was such a sophisticated facility that if you had, had, I mean, if, if you had not had the staff at the Harris that knew how to run that building, you'd be in a, if, if you were an organization that, uh, that had an old theater and built a new theater like the Harris, you've got to hire staff a year in advance to get the whole thing up to speed, to learn how to use all that sophisticated electronic equipment, all the lighting and the HVAC, all the things that are different than the Athenaeum Theater. You're at a whole different level. People's expectations are very different. But a lot of organizations save money by not getting anybody until, you know, say, well, we won't hire new staff until we open our doors. And terrible things happen to, as a result. So, that's a big issue. Are you do, ask uh, are any of these uh, cities able to do marketing beforehand, or are the variables just run down? Uh, uh, do you mean the, um, the the groups that are building it, not the city? Not you don't mean well, city sorry, government? Yeah. The, the groups that are building. They they try, but they've got so many calls on their money and mm -hmm. and their resources and their time that. They do their best, but it, again, unless you have a group of pros um, executing this, listening carefully, tracking what's happening, and knowing that you need to do things like marketing very carefully in advance. That's what the Smith Center did. They sold, before their doors opened, they had 16,000 subscriptions. That's huge, but that's because they had community buy-in. They knew exactly who their audience was, and they marketed to them from the from the very beginning of the project. But that's un we found that unusual. I guess I'm thinking just in terms of plotting out, you know, where the nearest um, other dance groups. Oh, you know, oh I see what you mean. No, that was the one thing that we found that was stunning. Every group that built thought that it was absolutely unique, mm -hmm. and that it. And when we asked them in the questionnaire, who is your nearest? Who is your biggest competitor, they say, we don't have one. It's fascinating. They don't have one. So they're offering something totally unique and fabulous, and therefore people will love it, and they'll come, and they'll support it. You know, so, Bob. You speculate on the future of the Logan Center? Um, <laughs> I have to admit, I was completely dazzled by it. I, I, I went through it, and I thought, this is interesting, because the University of Chicago did not treat the arts, the arts practitioners, very generously. Um, the rainy, leaky, tippy st uh, uh, studio, Midway Studios, where people had umbrellas <laughs> over their work as they were doing it. That, you know, that, that was, this is a really nice contrast to that. I think it's a total game changer. <coughs> I know for a fact that the building costs $114 million. I know for a fact that, uh, I think this is accurate, it's, it's somewhere just under $50 million was raised. It is a university teaching facility. It's for faculty, for students, it's for all kinds of activities. It would have gotten built at one point or another anyway. It needs, the university needed this. So trying to sort out um, the finances of that and figure out whether that's prudent or not within the framework of a multi-billion dollar institution is, is, is too hard a question for my brain. But I think it is going, I think it is a total game changer for the university. I think it's a stunningly beautiful building. And I think it's a, a eminently usable building. They thought really carefully about using it. And they spent a lot, I mean, in terms of the time span, they spent years. I have never seen so much talk and <laughs> documents and stacks of revised documents about what the meaning of this building was. The University of Chicago faculty went wild on this one. <laughs> and they all weighed in. And it was a rough go for a long time. But um, I've heard the quote that, I think this is uh, uh, Neil Harris said, I think the faculty still puzzled about what its role is going to be in this building, but but he said it'll sort out. So, <laughs> so I think it's I think it's a fantastic building. I'm really glad they did it, and 
I'm glad it's not in the center of campus. I'm glad that they're moving, you know, heading south and expanding the campus. I think it's, I think it's, I'm tired of being across the tundra over in the Harris School anyway. I wanna, <laughs> I wanna, be, I wanna be where the action is. <laughs> Sir. Did you look at all uh, at the effects? I know you said that you really couldn't look at uh, well, we tried. community effects in death. But uh, you know, I know one of the ideas behind the Logan Center is that it's going to revitalize that part of the campus and that part of the community. You know, I know one of the ideas behind the Dallas Art Center is that it's it going to revitalize, revitalize downtown. It. But at the same time, you wonder how many entertainment dollars there are to go around with all those institutions uh, in downtown Dallas, both from uh, the standpoint of uh, putting up the money in the first place and then sustaining uh, with subscriptions and, and ticket sales. Did you look at that at all? Is that, does that, did that weigh into your balance? Yes, and we actually, held, we actually held a conference at the same place up at the Rockefeller Founda uh, Brothers Foundation about four years, three, three years earlier on economic impact studies. And it was really fascinating because we took 100 economic impact studies on um, cultural buildings done by a specialist of sports stadiums. I mean, he, that's what, he did the work. And what we found was absolutely devastating. And it was very interesting for the art sector. It was a very a fascinating story. We had all these economists there. They analyzed all of these economic impact studies that were done for cities that were gonna build something. They, the consultants or whoever <coughs> did these studies, some of them very talented and rigorous people, some hopelessly um, ill-equipped people did them for, great, for significant sums of money. And they were all essentially useless. Only four or five of the hundred w w passed muster as rigorous that they could actually defend the multiples of income that would come from building such a building. But who would ever go back five years after something was built when the city is in a new crisis and paying attention to new problems about whether that was true or not? And the arts people in, our, in this conference said, oh great, thanks. This is the only thing we have that works. So you're going to debunk it and then publicly m ridicule it and then that leaves us with nothing. So could you come up with some kind of tool that we can use that would work for us? Because for the advocates that are raising the money out there, we need this. But, but the answer is oftentimes the multiples, I mean, the new, you have to find new money and the way I if you're going to claim you know, that this is gonna actually generate a lot of income. It can't just be money that washes in from somewhere else. The, to wit, the Disney um, Hall and the Dorothy Chandler. I mean, it's a huge success. It just sucked everyone over to the other building. Um, so, but again, who, who, who wants to spoil the party? So they do these studies, they get these figures, they go to the city council, they say, well, can we do have a $40 million bond issue on this? Will you help us with this? And the taxpayers will help and they'll really benefit, I can promise you, they'll really benefit if we do this. And so it goes. But, they're, but they're, it, they, to do a good economic impact study would cost sometimes, if the people paid 40 or 50,000 to do it, it would cost 500, 750 or a million dollars to do it, 750,000 to a million. To, to actually pull all the data together and actually come up with real answers. And then if you did it, you might be really disappointed because it might be a multiple of one and a half. And they go, well, we already spent a million on your study. I think we're not gonna do this, so. So uh, we really don't wanna be the killjoys. This is a terrible thing. I'm feeling like I'm, I'm like finger wagging, but there are some very inspiring projects. And exp you know, this, the thing about raising your endowment before you do it, having such confidence in your project that you say up front, we'll give you your money back. Um, but we believe this project is fabulous and it will work, and so back us. And now they're, they're a strong institution. So these are the kinds of stories we want to spread so that other institutions learn from this and do it themselves. Sir. Um, I think you said you studied about 50 some projects? Uh, 56. Yeah, so out of that, that many, how many would you Closely, say? that's 56 closely, quite closely. Yeah. So how many would you say were successful? I mean, I, I know it's successful part of the economy. It is hard, but uh, ultimately, I would say um, w well over half are, are successful in one, or, but they may not be successful for five years. The Carnival Center was a debacle in Miami. 
it just fell off a cliff. They fired directors and boards of trustees right and left. Spent, Carnival gave the money, the cruise line gave the money, and then Mrs. Arsht had to come in with $40 million and save it before, so it didn't just collapse in a heap. Um, it seems to be doing okay now. It's six, almost seven years later, and they seem to be stabilizing. So maybe, you know, that, that these, are, these are not stories with, um, you know, it's not a final, it's a success. It's like over, over a period of time. But I would say well over half. Eventually. And, but eventually, eventually. Yes. Um, you talked a lot about board governance and the role of leadership in terms mm -hmm. of making sure that uh, organizations stay sustainable over time. Um, but I noticed there was a good part of it. I thought that the graphic analysis of just showing how um, spaces were built over time was really interesting to me from a planning perspective. Do you think that that sort of, the results of your research on that side could inform people who are considering a venue at this point, or is it more still on the side of the people who are funding it? Oh, I hope it does. I mean, I hope people, I mean, for some people, that whole issue about the South being the place where all the activity, uh, a great deal of the activity was taking place is of no interest. Um, maybe if you don't live in the South, you're not that interested. But, but there, what we're finding, we, we found there's been a lot of calls, if, th if this answers your question, there have been a lot of calls from people in the South, like the Greensboro, North Carolina um, um, community. They've said, we've read this. And it's really interesting because you're right, they're building these all over the place. Maybe we should think about whether we actually need one or we should use the one that's down the road and invest more in our, our arts organizations themselves and not worry about a building right now if we actually, because one of the questions is, are we, that we have started with is, is, is cultural infrastructure, is co are cultural facilities overbuilt? I mean, do we have too much capacity? And one of our advisors to this project said, if I were king, I would ban all new performing arts centers for the next 25 years because we have space all over the place to do. And, and this raises a whole other, actually, if you don't mind, I'm just going to say, this raises a whole other really interesting issue. The way a new, younger generation is accessing the arts is so different. The fact that my friend at the LA, who was uh, head of performing at the LA Music Center said they now have a large, established permanent Twitter section for the, all the people that come and listen to music and then they Twitter constantly. They drive the people mad if they're <laughs> distributed around because the lights yeah, bother them and they just yeah. think, well, this person stop and back. <laughs> and, and, and so they've given up and they've made the Twitter section. These, the, if you build a very, very expensive hall, it's not clear that this is where arts participation is heading. That the way people consume the arts might not be in these enormous, expensive three and four hundred million dollar buildings. The Kimmel Center, I, I went to the Kimmel Center in Philadelphia. It was just breathtaking. I looked at it and I thought, this looks like our last building. If we were Rome, this would be our last really big <laughs> building. And it's 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 in bankruptcy, and the Philadelphia Orchestra is in bankruptcy. It is a glorious and huge, expansive, expensive building that just before it declared bankruptcy, I went to a gala there and they had a 140 foot replica of the Eiffel Tower glittering in the lobby. So it was the last day of the Pompeii thing, you know, <laughs> the end. And I just thought, how is this possible? How could you build a building this big and, and, and think that this was going to be sustainable over the long period. It's just, it's huge. But Philadelphia said, we're Philadelphia, and we have the Pew Foundation and the Benjamin Franklin Foundation and all these. We can do it. So, sir. Um, is it the buildings that make or break uh, these facilities, or can be a lack of follow through in terms of establishing uh, uh, an ongoing organization? And I think both. I think they can both, both of those are, I mean, it, it, if it takes good management of the of a facility and planning and the management, and then it takes good management and planning of the arts organization that's in it. And you, you sort of, you need both of them. And if, but oftentimes because of the, um, well, um, my, my wife said this, she works with the Harris board, the Harris Theater board, she said, I wish we had learned more about the technical 
consequences of building a building underground. Yeah, especially on the lake shore. Yeah. yeah. How do you prepare for that? I mean, the people, the man who built the Kaufman Center, two 2,400 seat theaters, side by side, spectacular structure, built in Kansas City because Mrs. Kaufman on her de deathbed said to her daughter, sweetie, I want a really big art center named for me. And then she passed. Um, <laughs> and so she did. So her sister, 17 years, or her daughter, 17 years later, it opens. Two 2,600 seat theaters side by side, built by Moshe Safdie. Remember Moshe Safdie? He did the, um, the village in Montreal, that boxy structure in 1964 or whenever it was at the um, Olympics. He had never, he's 77, 78 years old, he had never built a, perfor uh, any, a performing arts center before in his life. So they hire him. It is a fabulous building. It is so, but they forgot to have ways for people to get out easily. Oh. So the stairs all cram up and all the older people are going like this and afraid if they're going to plunge down the stairs. And you just go, what were they thinking? And it's all beautiful skylights. It is gorgeous. It is, my, uh, my wife said, the Harris Theater is wonderful, but this building is just, is transformational. It's so beautiful, but it's got serious internal issues about how, how it is, how, how well it actually functions. So it just shows you the levels of complexity, planning something that is beautiful, useful, sustainable. It's, it's, a, it's a hard task. So I think they did it at the Logan, actually, but we'll see. It hasn't been open long enough. And they also have the whole University of Chicago behind it. So. Um, I don't know if there's any. I'd be happy to stay for a few minutes. Is this yeah, good? No, I right? think this would be a good time. Um, thank you very much. It's a, uh, it's fascinating.